All right, so I, um, I'm grateful to be back. <laughs> um, I was at some pains thinking about this presentation, how to um, sort of use my time to take this issue forward, which is what I want to do, and at the same time uh, refresh your memories, because I'm sure not all of you remember exactly what I said in 2009. Some of you probably had had that heavy lunch and you weren't paying attention to everything I said. That's a joke. Um, I know you weren't, most of you probably weren't there. Um, so, <clears throat> but we've had uh, most of that presentation already from Dr. Tennis and B. So, the essence of it was that there is, as you've heard twice already, a long history of bibliocentricity in the library catalog. Of course, I came to that from um, my early career where I spent 15 years as a music cataloger in a major in the University of Illinois Library at Urbana-Champaign. And there was a constant um, sort of political stress that's a, an enormous library, one of the world's largest libraries. And there were, at the time, 37 departmental libraries, the music library in which I worked was one of the world's largest collections of music. And so we would haul ourselves over to the main building to go to cataloging councils or ca principal cataloger advisory meetings, or when Michael Gorman was our director, he would have us all in to go through our statistics. And we were constantly in trouble because music cataloging was different from all the other kinds. And they wouldn't, they sort of refused to understand that. And of course that's because the music isn't books, and therefore the music cataloging is as not good as the music is not good. The good things are in the main catalog, in the main library, and all that other stuff are in the 36 other buildings, those things are not good. And that, that sort of attitude prevailed. And later when I became chair of CCDA, which was then the committee that was writing AACR 2 and a half, um, you know, we had the same problem always with non-book materials and, uh, and with um, input, particularly from our Canadian colleagues who had a strong tradition of, uh, of providing access to visual materials and moving image materials and other things that were used in education, much more so than in the U.S. So there is just this long history of bibliocentricity, and when I coined that term, I had no idea it would find such uh, purchase in the knowledge organization community. But it does, it does go on. So my question today is, can the online catalog become a synergistic tool instead of just an online card list? I wrote a small book called Cultural Synergy in Information Institutions. It was published last summer by Springer Herlog. And it's only 88 pages. You can read it, you know, with your morning coffee. Um, but the purpose of the book was to to let me ventilate what I think is the truth about what is information as a science, and what how does knowledge organization play a role in that, and where are the synergies? How are museums and archives and libraries, and major classification schemes and Facebook and all sorts of things that are essentially institutionalized information sources. How are they the same? How would it be better if there were synergistic action among them? So when I get to the library catalog toward the end of the book, I suggest that the catalog could stop being a flat file uh, inventory of objects in a building that people don't visit anymore and could instead become a synergistic tool that would help us bring together things that are related but not obviously so. And if you know me in other uh, conferences, you'll see that's also a theme in my research. How do we discover things we want to discover but we cannot find them because they are not semantically related, uh, they're not obviously similar. So I wanted to bring that idea together with this notion of bibliocentricity. It's been six years since I wrote that first paper. AACR2 has um, vanished into the background. Uh -huh. And RDA, Resource Description and Access, has come on the scene as of uh, mid-2013. And, and we, we, we have, it's a brave new world, isn't it? 
Um, has RDA changed everything, or has it just uh, taken us down a, uh, the wrong fork in the road? So that's one of my questions. Before I get too carried away with that metaphor, though, I have to say, I have to remind you how old I am. I was one of the people who was actually there when co 2 was published, and we had to implement it. Michael Gorman was my boss. The Library of Congress said, no, 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 we're not going to do that until we close our catalog for years from now. Michael said, nonsense, you're going to do it. And so all the catalogers at Illinois learned to use co 2 And we're all walking around, well, what's the big, you know, the big brouhaha? It said there were commissions and studies and, and people carried on and there was a huge uproar and it went on for years, but in fact, the rules weren't very different at all, you know? I mean, the slash went in the same place and you know, there were a few little things that changed. Uh, so I think this is true about RDA as well. There's a lot of fuss and ruckus about it, but in fact, it's just a small incremental step. So if that's the case, then what might actually move us closer to a synergistic <laughs> model? And my suggestion is that the uh, FRBR object-oriented ontology is the tool that we might use to move toward that model. So that's my trajectory here. Um, I'm going to revisit the original study just briefly to remind you what really was in it. And playing with my laptop won't help you. All right, so in, as you've heard already in that early study, what I, I was able to demonstrate was the persistence of the cult of the title page and the persistence of this notion that books were good and other things um, were not, and that meant that other things didn't really need to be described well. Um, they could be forced into the, the monographic mold, and if it didn't work out, who cares? Nobody wants that stuff, it's not good. I tried to uh, talk about the concept of objectivity, by which I meant that um, the point of the catalog as we saw it then, or as I think we still should see it, was to um, assist users in what Patrick Wilson called exploitative power. I don't have time to wax eloquently about Patrick Wilson, but, but he said essentially the, that we have this uh, bibliographical apparatus in which we've listed everything uh, that we already have. And since we already have it, we don't need to find it, right? So, the, so a simple finding tool is good enough. Now what happens to the scholar who needs to find something he doesn't know exists? How does that person interact with this system and use it to create new knowledge? To the extent that the user can create new knowledge from what's in the apparatus, then we find the system to be efficacious. And to the, reason, and to the extent the person is obstructed, the system is not efficacious. And as my doctoral students will all tell you, I point this out early on in the PhD as a critical moment in the, in the, the 1960s when uh, bibliographic control finally had a, an empirical way to quantitatively analyze the problems with the online catalog. Is it efficacious or not? Yes or no? Does this help or does it hinder? So what we see is this sense of objectivity. I just transcribed the title page. I just give the author's name in the order in which it appears on the title page. I just tell you how many pages are in it. That objectivity is really a way of wearing blinders and of not being open to the content and the potential use of the knowledge that's in the resource. That's my um, hobby horse. So there were seven cases in the study and we can revisit them today. And um, let me just go through them quickly. What you see here is there's a mark record in the upper left hand corner and you can't read them well, I know. Uh, what I wanted you to be able to see was that, um, oh, I can't write on it while I'm talking about it, can I? Okay, so we have the word pages now instead of a P period, and we have three fields that say text and mediated and volume, and that's the extent to which RDA <laughs> has made a real difference in cataloging at this point in 2015. Now, I know I'm being a little bit silly. If I had really wanted to be serious, I would have taken the elements apart and said these are manifestation related, these are character related, these are work related, these are expression related, 
And I'll do that in the written version, don't worry. So I'll give you something to look forward to. But really, uh, RDA has uh, implemented a new theoretical model, but it hasn't taken us very far. What we have here is the, the change, the FDR book is a biography about FDR, and there are lots of biographies of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The thing that was important about this book is this reporting about the Newport scandal in which FDR was involved in a, a scandalous event where some homosexuals were identified having drinks together and he uh, uh, helped in their persecution. And although the, the event is well known and well documented, it was um, uh, hidden in his biography until this time. This was really the first explication of it. So here's a place where people uh, studying the advance of homosexual gay culture, I should say, in uh, the mid 20th century should be able to find this and find its list of sources and pursue that. But it was hidden by the objectivity of the catalog. Reaching for Glory is one of the Michael Bushloss uh, books you, uh, created from transcripts of LBJ's presidency. Um, LBJ and not Richard Nixon implemented the secret White House system that taped conversations that everybody LBJ spoke with, uh, took part in, even I mean, in his office, but also in his bedroom and on the phone and everything. So what we see in the transcripts are LBJ and Lady Bird and everybody else, the embarrassing parts I think are his phone calls with uh, Jacqueline Kennedy and she doesn't really want to talk to him but she has to, she doesn't really want to call him Mr. President but she has to and he's always trying to be obsequious and she doesn't like it at all, that's entertaining. Here we have Lady Bird saying my dear friends Jim and Willis are house guests. Well what they really are are um, doctors from the Mayo Clinic and uh, Emory University, and she's invited them to dinner so that they can secretly figure out what's wrong with LBJ. She's convinced he's dying. And uh, at the end, she says, oh, it turns out that it hurts their vision, everything is fine, all the basic organs work. So there, there's a lot of information about the presidency going on there. Um, again, the book is just listed as a book with a title and, a, and an author and a subject heading and all of that detail gets lost. Here's another book, uh, Jesus the Revolutionary Biography um, by John Dominic Cross, and this is an older book. Um, I just bring it up because, um, well, there are two concepts here. One is uh, this information about illness and disease. Um, disease is something that happens to the body, illness is something that happens to the person in society. When um, in, the, in the story when it says the person was healed, it doesn't mean they got well. It means that the person was welcomed back into the house so people were cast out. So healing uh, is about um, illness, not about disease. It's about hospitality essentially. But then there's this whole business about if it's a girl cast it out, another thing that you know we, we like to read about the precious infant children, but that's not what is said in these texts at all. Children were thought of as, uh, well, I have squirrels in my garage, and uh, while we've been having this conference, uh, various people have been up there setting traps and nailing holes shut and trying to get rid of the damn things. And that's how children were thought of in that time. They were they had to be fed, they couldn't work, they were too small. They weren't precious the way we think of children today. And so, uh, and they often were cast out if there was no money to pay them. I mean, to feed them. Okay, this is a little bit happier. This is um, a DVD of most of Julia Child's uh, performances on the TV show, The French Chef. It's from her as a small, Boy, I learned that if that why you don't want an open concept house, because if you drop the chicken on the floor and the people are sitting there, they can see you, and if they're in the dining room, they won't know, and you just take it out and say, oh, it's done. <laughs> okay, she actually talks like that. Um, but she taught Americans how to eat fresh food. I mean, yes, she was cooking in the traditional French style, 
and yes, she was funny sometimes, and, uh, but she was, and, and terrible things happened on the show while she was cooking. It was no food network. Um, <laughs> But she, it was a great success and a great cultural catalyst. What do we have here? We have um, a 245 heel that says the French chef too. Well, that's all the title page we've got. Where is there room for any more uh, data about this resource? So notice that catalogers have uh, written a summary note and maybe uh, and put in the episode titles and a contents note. There's no linkage, of course, to the episodes or their content. Uh, by the way, I was interested to discover only the books have been RDA'd in the WorldCat. Um, Non-books haven't. Okay, here is um, a DVD, a Nova episode about Fairmont's Last Theorem. And if you watch the whole thing, I used to use it to teach research methods to terrify my incoming doctoral students. Uh, to say, here's a man who spent most of his life solving a real problem and to watch the way he thinks. So it's really as much about um, math and quantum physics as it is about this man and his discovery. All that gets lost in the cataloging. I'll never finish in time. <laughs> All right, this is the quintessential Billy Holiday. It is a three disc set of most of her recordings and it's on a compact disc and as you see it doesn't even fill the three by five card because there's no title page. Almost done, J.S. Bach, well of course we have a complete bibliographic record, it's classical music, although it isn't, uh, but it's um, Bach and he's respected. And look at that, it's actually uh, the Clavier Buchlein for Wilhelm Cleveland Bach, which is in the uh, series, new edition of the Collected Works of Bach. It's also in a sub-series uh, piano and uh, keyboard music. So it's in a series which is in a series, and, and it's a volume which came from somewhere else. It's a facsimile. So it's a really complex aggregate, uh, but all you see here is the list of works by Bach in the contents. So what does RDA give us? It gives, uh, what does FRBA give us that makes RDA different? It gives us this entity relationship model, works, expressions, manifestations, items. It's still a flat model. One of the problems with FRBR is that each entity uh, requires its preceding entity. You can't have an expression unless there was a work first. You can't have a manifestation unless it records an expression, and so on. And as a matter of fact, in reality, it doesn't work that way. People have ideas, people publish things that don't have ideas. <laughs> um, an expression is not uh, linked directly to a work, and a manifestation is not necessarily linked directly to an expression in a temporal sequence. So what we have is a flat sequence rather than a rich uh, multi-dimensional sequence, which is what we need. So what I want to say, I already said, is that Forcing, I mean, RDA is a minor step forward because it moves us from uh, inventories of title pages to an entity relationship model, but it doesn't um, take us away from the objective violence created by the objectivity of recording title pages. And this is really where knowledge organization comes in. We have a potential multi-dimensional structure in which classes of objects uh, could be revealed but instead we just fit things under what we find on their title pages. So I best, I, I best hurry, right? So FRBR OO is the object-oriented version. You can look it up on the web. Um, as you can see, uh, works are not something that come from authors necessarily, but the publication can be considered a work apart from the ideational content um, here's just a, an example just to show you there are that many steps getting from a work to uh, an expression and the expression might be self-contained or might not. All this is based on empirical evidence in the meetings people would say what's an example of when this might happen and we would haul up the data and say well here are seven and so what we've done with FRBR object oriented is create this complex 
and I suggest synergistic model. So let me just say, it last slides, um, what we have here are nested. We have uh, a compiled book that's made up of edited transcripts. The edited transcripts are on top of actual transcriptions of tapes, and the tapes at the base as the resources. So what we have here really are four expressions, but how are the expressions? There was LBJ was not writing a work when he was chattering on the phone. So here we have four expressions that become manifest uh, in something that never was a work. Um, so there's richness there that we won't find in the Whammy model that RDA has incorporated. Uh, but this one is just better, I think, than music people here today. So for each recording on these three CDs, we have this kind of data. This is a CD set. It's a digital production. The producer was Michael Brooks. Larry Keyes did all the restoration and engineering to produce the digital uh, sound that's found on the compact discs. And they called it the quintessential Billy Holiday. Notice it was published in 1987. That probably wasn't in CD format, was it? Um, by CBS Records. But each piece in there, and there are 30 in the first one, so maybe 100 pieces. Your mother's son-in-law, for instance, was played by Benny Goodman and his orchestra, and this was captured in New York on November 27, 1933. That's captured. It's nested in Columbia's Matrix, which was the original recording, and that's nested in the released recording uh, 28-50-16, which is nested in this record. So we have here a multi-layered uh, resource set. These are all manifestations, A, of the same sound, but they're all slightly different because on each re-release, the sound is re-engineered. So I just want to suggest that uh, bibliocentrism is still alive. RDA is a minor step forward, but it's not a major step forward. F-R-B-R-O-O. -O. Uh, I wish I could say it the way Patrick Leboeuf does in French. It comes out much better, but I can't <laughs> copy him. But um, the F-R-B-R-O-O model is a way to move us farther forward toward a synergistic future where we can really use what we know about knowledge organization to improve resource description. Thank you. Once in your life. Uh, I have one at press right now. 
and uh, we've just been, our, I mean, they've had it since November, I don't know what the age they think they're doing. Uh, it's, uh, they've been, we've been arguing the last two weeks about the typesetting of the index. I mean, you know, I don't care. They keep asking me, so yeah, I don't care. Just publish today. Uh, but the title page they set it up, I didn't know it was going to be on it until I got the final proofs. It's not really something the author has anything to do with. And if you look historically at the evolution of the monograph across time, it really began as the publisher's call upon. You know, at the very end, like an artist would sign his painting, the publisher would say, I'm publishing this, I printed it, here's how I did it, here's what I want it called. All that got moved to the front to make it more marketable. But it has nothing to do, in most cases, with the author or the author's intent. Well, what I mean is the whole, the entire book as an artifact, if, if you provide, or the, the entity as an artifact, the, the album or whatever, if you provide um, a huge amount of context to that person who is uh, examining the, the poss possibility of acquiring or, or seeing that or hearing that material, uh, are you somehow changing the experience? that a person back in 1933 would, would, would have us uh, hearing that. Well, I'm not suggesting that you change the artifact. I'm suggesting that you link it. I, I said I believe the semantic web is a hoax because, yeah. you know, because that was the only semantic web that can solve all our problems. We don't need to worry about anything anymore. This is like back in the 19, uh, early 1980s when you got a little uh, dot matrix printer on the circulation desk and Everyone said we don't have to have an online catalog because everything's in the computer now. We put it all in the computer, all had the call number and the volume number. It was for circulating things. Um, but here's a set of actual linkages we could make. That's what I'm talking about is linking things. Yes, here's an artifact. Here are other radiational resources to which it's related. If you're interested in this, you might be interested in those. Or if you're interested in any one member of this set, here are related linkages. You're just creating pathways. But you asked this morning, I thought I'd talk too much then, but <laughs> it's my turn. Uh, uh, whether things, I mean, the artifacts definitely should be kept. I want someone somewhere to keep a copy of it. I keep throwing things out. My mantra is I am not the Library of Congress. But someone somewhere ought to have a copy of that thing because the way the pages are laid out and the way the paper works and the way the binding constrain uh, the way the pages open, all that is important evidence about the transmission of the text.
need to provide more you know, playful and intuitive knowledge aggregation system than more educational knowledge aggregation system because even though we force them to teach you know, how to use the system, they're not gonna get it <laughs> because it's not because they're, you know, the knowledge organization system is wrong, it's because their cognitive ability is not advanced enough. So, to me. 